Hi, this is Ed Driscoll for PJMedia.com, and we're talking with Andrew Marcus, the director of the new documentary, Hating Breitbart, which is due out later this month at your local movie theater. And Andrew, thank you for stopping by today. Oh, great to be with you. Home again on PJ. Yeah. Andrew, the last time we spoke, you were the first in-house video maker for PJ Media back in its very early days in late 2005 and 2006. How did you go from making YouTube clips, some of the first YouTube clips, in fact, to crafting a documentary for the movie theater? I can tell you, I can, I can really pretty much draw a straight line. I mean, the experience that I had working with Pajamas Media in those early days, you know, thank goodness for, for you know, Glenn Reynolds and Roger Simon taking a chance on me and let me, turning me loose to go out there and cover stuff. Uh, you know, I was, it, it, it had me on the ground, you know, covering you know, uh, protests and different events. And, you know, that's where I really, you know, caught the bug for covering these sorts of things. And I, you know, uh, I just started from there. And I, you know, I, I uh, covered protests, anti-war protests. When the Tea Party started, I was you know, on the ground covering tea parties. And it didn't take long for me to, you know, in the in the duty of covering the Tea Party to come across Andrew Breitbart and one thing led to another, and the next thing you know, I was producing a documentary about the guy. How much footage of Andrew Breitbart did you actually end up shooting? We have, um, I don't actually have the breakdown of exactly how much is Andrew, but we have a, a, over 100 hours of total footage, which includes you know, other interviews and, and other people as well, but he's the overwhelming bulk of most of that content, and we have many, many, many hours of him. And it was really a a, a, a chore, a, a labor of love to to you know to choose uh, you know from amazing content to get it down to an hour and a half. Uh, it was an editor's uh, uh, luxury and cross to bear. What initially made Andrew decide that he wanted somebody following him around and shooting footage of him in action? Andrew was an open book. You know, I think almost anybody that profiled him would 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 agree with me on this. That, you know, he didn't really he wouldn't say no to anybody who wanted to talk with him or to cover him, uh, whether they were ideologically aligned with him or not. He felt that that he didn't have anything to hide. He was operating from a place of honesty, and that there was no downside to having people cover him because of that. Um, now how, you know, that's, it's a little bit different, you know, from a, you know, a New Yorker, uh, profile where they're with him for a couple of days versus a film crew where we were with him on and off for, you know, two and a half years. Um, uh, but he just felt like, you know what, if you guys think there's a story here, I'm going to let you in. And he was, it was really amazing because we, we basically said, you know, we wanted we wanted to you know, shoot this film. We I said the way I pitched it to him was I said, you know, I, I sort of see a cross between you two's Joshua Tree and Spinal Tap. You're a rock star who doesn't take himself too seriously. And I think he must have you know I he probably you know one part liked the idea and one part thought I was a little crazy, but you know he he took a leap of faith with me and, and let me in to do it. Well, Andrew was such a big fan of 80s pop music. I'm sure he'd love those analogies. Right. right. And it's a classic filmmaker thing to, you know, to describe the project you have in your mind by combining two other ones. It's almost, it's almost cliche, but it, it worked. You know? Thankfully, it worked. He let us in. Now, I said at the top of the interview that the documentary was due out later this month, and the key word, unfortunately, is later. Its release was delayed a week. Is that correct? Oh. And what happened? I'm almost. I'm my. I, I have a little ulcer that's almost just acting up. Just even, even thinking about it. You know, we were scheduled to come out October 12th, and we hit a little bump in the road. And that little bump in the road is known as MPAA. Now, let me start out by saying, I respect the MPAA. I actually like the MPAA because if you think about it, what they represent is a private sector solution to prevent the government from coming in and censoring films, okay? So from that perspective, I think they actually serve a very valuable purpose. I think in our case, we're the victims of of a little bit of inconsistent treatment. And I don't know what motivates that inconsistency. I think it's 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 too difficult to to read the tea leaves on why we get in we well, got an inconsistent resp- uh, result there. But 
the bottom line is, you know, they rated the film R, and we we appealed, um, and, and the way that we appealed was we recut the, we you know, we didn't recut the film, but we went in and we we removed some of the language that was giving us the R rating. The I'll give you the nuts and bolts of it. The first time we submitted the film, there were nine instances of the F word. Okay, and that's we've that. You, I wasn't surprised that we got an R rating for that. But the idea was that they would tell us, you know, give us some more guideline in terms of how to get to PG-13, and we would address it. And so we took the guideline that they gave us, and I went in and I removed the F word from everyone in the film except Andrew. And, I, and in fact, actually, I did remove one small one of Andrew's because he's not even facing camera when he says it, and it's not really integral to depicting him as he was, okay? And by, re- by removing all of those and the one of Andrew that took us down to four, and it seems to be, you know, widely held belief that, you know, for the MPAA, if you, can, if, you're, if you have four or less, you can get that PG-13. And I have to say, I was a bit surprised when they came back to us again and said, nope, you're still in our rating. And, you know, I'll tell you, at, at, at first I thought, okay, well, well, look. On one hand, I'm a you know, I'm a, I'm sort of a punk filmmaker, and I was kind of like, yeah, I've got an R rating on my conservative film. Who's ever heard of that before, right? I was I was sort of ready to roll with it, and then my distributor and my my promoters came back and said, this is going to kill us. This is devastating. It's going to it's going to really harm us in the marketplace because there's a lot of conservative groups that, as much as they love Andrew. They have a, they're going to have a real problem, you know, with their own organizations pushing a movie that's R-rated. And not only that, I began to get a lot of information about other films that, that received a PG-13. And by example, Social Network, okay? Social Network reportedly has multiple uses of the F word. They've got partial nudity, which is sexually suggestive. There's somebody doing cocaine. There's people doing bong hits out of a three-foot-tall graphics bong. And that's all scripted. So every single one of those things is pre-planned and intentionally executed. PG-13. And I began to realize, you know, this is sort of violating my sense of fairness. You know, our, our, our language use was not scripted. We didn't intentionally have it there. It's what the people on camera did. And even though we tried to address it and clean it up, it still wasn't enough. Um, Another example, uh, Iron Man 2, PG-13, Iron Man 2. I mean, come on. How violent is the premise in in Iron Man 2, PG-13? There's a movie out right now called Taken 2. If I'm not mistaken, the premise of Taken 2 is a mother and daughter who are kidnapped. And then saved. And I bet they I bet they weren't saved with kick gloves. I bet they were saved with some violence. And that got a PG thirteen. And I, you know, I began to think about it. I was like, you know what? This isn't right. And I you know, I I took to heart what my distributor and my promoters were saying in terms of, you know, they they really they were the ones that lobbied me to push it back a week. And I decided, you know what? As much as I really don't want to push it back because the community uh, is, is excited to, to – they were looking forward to it coming out on the 12th. I, I just decided, you know what, we, it, it's, the film would be served if we can get the MPAA to change its mind. So we wrote them last week and said, please reconsider. Well, we will push the film back a week to give you time to, to reconsider this rating. Well, is it possible just to beep them all and then restore those f bombs once the film is released onto DVD? My feeling is I'm gonna, I, I would take the opposite approach, where I will I'm going to leave them in. I, I have a real problem censoring Andrew Breitbart. He's he's no longer here to to give his blessing to do it. And and, and more than that, the idea of a documentary about this person forget that it's about Andrew Breitbart, whoever it is. To then censor the language of the person makes it, uh, for me, it's a trouble spot in terms of presenting a documentary that's portraying the person and who they were and what they were like. Now, my feeling is, theatrically, I, I, I'm not prepared to, to censor another word in the film. I've got, you know, I mean, we, we, we cut it almost in half, you know. And these are, these are not just, you know, incidental or casual uses of the F word in terms of, I mean, these are, these are, uses of the F word that were 
that illustrate who Andrew Breitbart was. You know, he wasn't the guy that was, you know, uh, 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 you know, the cleanest speaker in the room. He he spoke off the cuff and spoke his mind, and sometimes that was the F word. Now, my feeling is. When I put the DVD out, the DVD is going to have two versions on it. It's going to have a version that is the uh, explicit version, and it's going to have a version that will have all of that uh, taken out, so that you'll you'll have the choice. But the problem is in the theater, I can't give people the choice to see the explicit version or the censored version. I have to I have to choose. And so if people aren't going, if they're not going to be able to make the choice, if I have to make the choice, I want to I want to try and leave him as intact as possible. Now. Is it possible for the MPAA to delay the film even further? Because obviously they know that once Election Day rolls around, the interest in this film is going to drop precipitously. Um, we, will not, we will not push it back further. If it has to go out R, it's going to go out R. Ah, okay. Yeah. Now, I first met Andrew in 2005 at the Pajamas Media launch in New York. And that, Andrew Breitbart, was a surprisingly reserved person compared to the showman who would dominate the tea parties and Twitter, and perhaps in his finest moment, Anthony Weiner's press conference. This is particularly amazing, given that Andrew's initial rise to fame, at least his initial moderate fame, was as the backroom technical boffin behind the scenes at first the Drudge Report and then the Huffington Post. What was it like watching this transformation of Andrew to becoming such a master showman? Well, you know, we began documenting him. Well, I, we began documenting him before we even knew we were making a movie about the guy, because, like I said, I was documenting the Tea Party. And so, you know, my first real uh, encounter with him uh, was at the Quincy Tea Party, uh, September twelfth, two thousand nine. Now, this was two days after the launch of Big Government and the first two videos uh, of the Acorn videos from James O'Keefe and Hannah Giles. And so I really entered his world at the beginning of this meteoric rise. And Andrew Breitbart became what he became, I believe, in reaction to his context and his surroundings. And here was a guy that was, he put out this story, and he put it out so deftly in a way that, you know, uh, uh, eviscerated the media narrative that would have been built around this story had it come out traditionally, which would have been, it would have been on the news maybe for one night, and then it would have been out of the news cycle and gone, they'd have been on to the next thing, and there would have been nothing that would have ever come of it. And Andrew's goal was to circumvent that inevitability and actually get people to pay attention to what was going on and get results because of that coverage. And because he was so successful at that, he was vilified. And Andrew Breitbart as it turns out, was not the kind of guy that was just going to sit back and take it. He was not going to be civil in the face of incivility. And that's, I think, what really informed the Andrew Breitbart we all came to know. So I guess I didn't really see the arc so much as I saw pretty much from the liftoff of what he became. Well, I don't think there was anybody better at taking the left's tactics, particularly as espoused by the late Saul Alinsky, whom both Hillary and Obama have expressed their admiration for, and turning them back against the left, as you just mentioned. In your estimation, how did Andrew learn and perfect these techniques? He realized that they were full of crap. Okay. <laughs> you know, he, if you go to these protests, if you go to, you know, the, 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 at, at the time that Andrew was sort of coming of age of his realization of these, of these protest tactics, you know, it was acorn uh, out on the street protesting. But, you know, we, there were numerous examples, and you can still find them today, you know, where they, these protesters are out there and they're carrying signs and they have no clue what sign they're carrying. The sign was pre-made for them, and they don't even know what the sign means. You know, perfect example, Andrew Breitbart was at a uh, Right Online conference in Chicago, and it was a Glenn Beck event, and it's in a big stadium, a big auditorium. And Obama for America, Organizing for America, they bust out, using public school buses, by the way, a group of people from who knows where in the city of Chicago to come protest this event, okay? So they get on the property, and they're parked right next to the front door of the, of the auditorium. And as people are, people are arriving, and as speakers are arriving, especially the speakers, they're just walking straight in the door, okay? They don't want anything to do with the protesters. 
Andrew Breitbart got out of his car and walked straight to the protesters. And he just, he, all he did was simply walk up to them. They're, they're chanting, you know, Glenn Beck, go away, you know, no hate in our state. They're saying Glenn, Glenn Beck's a hateful guy, okay? And Andrew Breitbart just looks at, he goes up to the, he goes up to, as it turns out, he goes up to the protest organizer and he says, can you name one thing that Beck has said that's hateful? Not a hundred, just one. Can you name one thing that Beck has said that's hateful? And the guy couldn't name one thing. The fact is, is that the narrative that they had constructed to be there to protest was so meaningless and incidental, as they used to say uh, in the days of Columbia, the issue isn't the issue. It's about the organizing, and it's about making noise and having a media, stealing media coverage from somebody else's event. Andrew realized that all he had to do was scratch the surface on these guys and they wouldn't have any clue what to do because they're never confronted. All that happens is the media goes and gets their talking points and they put their package up. And Andrew Breitbart realized if you just press them a little bit, they fold. And that's exactly what they did. Those guys packed up their protest and were gone 10 minutes after Andrew Breitbart arrived. If Andrew were still alive today, what do you think he would make of the election so far, both the MSM's coverage and the right's pushback against it? He'd say, I told you so. (laughs) He was at CPAC last year. He said, everything is going to be a dog whistle. Everything is going to be racist. And boy, right, Chicago is racist. I mean, golf is racist. it's ridiculous. I mean, I think he would have said, I told you so. Unless this is something you address in the documentary, this question is somewhat off topic. But when Andrew first passed away, the people who knew him personally and had seen him before he died mentioned that he appeared ill and cautioned him to see a doctor. And yet conservative websites that really should know better went into grassy knoll conspiracy territory about Breitbart's death. What do you make of that sort of stuff? Well, you know, I... I don't blame people for for jumping to the, that conclusion. You know, uh, the human mind looks to connect dots, and sometimes things happen that are just senseless. And Andrew's death, while you know, if you look at it from a physical standpoint, from his from his health, you know, it's hard for people to to compute. The guy was so young, and and people don't want to think, wow, this can actually. If you believe that Andrew Breitbart died of natural causes, then you have to believe that it could happen to you. You know, I think that scares people. And I think that, you know, that with the fact that he had just two months earlier said, I've got tape that's going to take the president down. Um, you know, I think people, I, I sort of don't blame them for coming to that conclusion, especially because unless you were very close to him, you didn't know that he had had a heart condition, you know, a heart episode a year earlier. Um, you know, for those of us that were around him, we saw that he, not only did this guy burn the candle from both ends, he burnt it in the middle, too. He had tireless energy. And, uh, you know, I guess I certainly didn't see it coming. And I didn't think that he was in ill health. But I, and I, to, that, that this happened, you know, I, I, it's a mixture. I guess on one hand it's shocking, and on the other hand it's sort of, I guess it's not surprising, I, I suppose. But I guess this is the, the human condition, the frailty of the human man. Talking with Andrew Marcus, the director of Hating Breitbart. Andrew, as a documentary filmmaker, do you have any thoughts on Dinesh D'Souza's surprise hit, Obama 2016, or any of the other politically themed movies that are making the rounds this fall? I think it is. It's absolutely exciting. And you know what I think we're seeing? And again, Andrew Breitbart, I think, really, really predicted that this was going to eventually happen. I don't know that, that he could have predicted how quickly it was going to happen. But the same way that the media has lost its monopoly on the narrative, Hollywood is losing theirs. And it's happening for the same reason. The digital revolution in filmmaking, in both acquisition and in distribution, is bringing down the barrier. It's lowering the bar. Uh, and making the technology more accessible to more people. There's just so much more competition now in terms of product that I think that this was an inevitability, that eventually stories that were counter-narrative, counter to the narrative that Hollywood uh, uh, seems to uh, be obsessed with with portraying, 
Uh, the, people are so hungry for that, and now the technology is allowing for producers to get content to the people who want to see it. So I think it's 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 I'm totally heartened by it. I, I I'm so thrilled for 2016's success, and I and I, you know our film is definitely different from 2016, but I'm really proud to see the 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 market uh, asserting itself and and consuming the product that they that they deserve they've been you know th- there's a huge section of the market that should been absolutely neglected by Hollywood for years. Let's switch for a moment from the big screen to the small screen. Andrew, you gave me plenty of excellent video advice when you were PJM's in-house video maker, and certainly in 2010 we saw a plethora of citizen journalists armed with video cameras who definitely made a difference in the midterms, including the footage that you shot for your own foundingbloggers.com website. Do you have some advice for those who wish to jump in and start producing their own videos, whether for their blogs or for YouTube or both? Uh, you know, I honestly, the, 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 secret, the secret to getting to producing viral video is showing up. I, I, we, I have, yeah, I, it's, it's so rare that there will be a protest or some kind of gathering where something interesting doesn't happen, where some glaring example of, of bias or some glaring example of idiocy or of brilliance occurs. You have to show up. After that, there's some just very basic technique issues. You know, think about your framing. Hold your camera still. You know, what do you, how are you recording sound? Is it on the camera? Well, then stand close enough so that you can capture the sound of the people that are talking. Those are very simple things. and Those don't take long to, to, to pick up the technique of, and, and anybody can do that. The main thing is show up. And for those who wish to show up to see Hating Breitbart, where should they go for more information about the film and its showtimes? You can go to HatingBreitbart.com, and you can also follow us at Hating Breitbart on Twitter. And We are coming out the 19th. All right. This has been Ed Driscoll for PJMedia.com, and we've been talking with Andrew Marcus, the director of the new documentary, Hating Breitbart, which, as Andrew just mentioned, is due out on October 19th at your local theater. And Andrew, thank you once again for stopping by today. Thank you so much for having me on. Take care.